I've just made the big move from Windows 11 to Linux Mint. Do I regret doing it? We'll discuss that as we go along. The first thing that helped me make the switch was having an injured toe, which meant I could spend a lot of time at the computer. But you don't need such an excuse. Some previous experience of Linux also came in handy. I've used Chromebooks a lot over the years. I've worked with Unraid a fair bit. And so I'm not afraid of the command line. And, and that's a big deal. As much as some people say, uh, Linux is all GUI now. You, you can just navigate uh, user interfaces. It's all very accessible. That's not 100% my experience. Yeah, if something isn't working as intended, I still find it's easiest most of the time to jump into the terminal and write do this rather than navigate a bunch of UI to try and find the button that says do that. Even with a very clean, user-friendly setup, at times I still find that's necessary. Thankfully, I have a long-held interest in Linux. It's such a huge and exciting space in IT, the global movement towards open operating systems. And it powers so much of the world from large businesses, servers, it's all around us. And like many of us, I have a desire for better privacy and security. Now that's a hard thing to measure, but Linux's independence versus the big companies, Apple, Microsoft, Google, it's a plus for privacy. And being a smaller creature in the big animal kingdom is arguably good for security, You're less of a target. And Linux's openness is arguably the other big plus here. The democratization of how Linux operates and being able to see inside every line of code means there are so many people around the world who are keeping an eye on what it is doing and what it isn't doing. In a way, moving to Linux means shifting your trust from a big company like Microsoft over to people. Just trusting people. There's pros and cons. And as time goes on and the internet is becoming less recognizable and everything is machine learning this and artificial algorithms that, my desire to control the technology that I own is growing all the time. Yeah, so a big thing that helped me switch to Linux is my constantly reinforced frustration with Google, Microsoft and the like. I swear big tech is more out of touch with average human people than ever, or out of touch with me at least. Windows is an increasingly noisy operating system that requires you to sign into your Microsoft account and is incorporating AI features left, right and center that I haven't been convinced that I that I want to know anything about yet. It's really an uphill battle to try and tame Windows and, and make it do what I want it to do and as little else as possible. And that's where Linux does a really good job. On Linux, there are far fewer processes happening in the background that I don't know about. On Windows, my PC's fans will often spin up uh, and it's clearly thinking about something, I don't know what it is. Whereas on Linux, it's just much less common that anything significant will happen unless I myself have activated a process. But even with all that ideation, I certainly had some hesitation about making the move. But one thing that made me feel better about dipping my toe in the Linux water to see if it's fine is how easy it is to dual boot. These days it's so breezy to just add a partition alongside your Windows One, install Linux there, and then you can boot into whichever operating system every time you turn on your computer. It's a highly recommended approach to get started into Linux, which is why I enjoyed thinking about it, and then I just decided to delete Windows altogether and just dive straight into Linux. YOLO. Luckily, here in 2024, Linux is in a good state. I I'm impressed by what I've seen. It's more accessible than it's ever been before, absolutely for sure. That's not to say that any of the distros are gonna hold your hand as much as Windows, but with the likes of Zorin, I think you could get pretty close. And Zorin looks really great, by the way. For me, it was a choice between Zorin, Pop! OS, and Linux Mint, all very accessible, user-friendly starting places. I ended up going with Mint. And though it's essentially an operating system like any other, and you know, you won't get too lost around here, all distros are laid out differently, and it was important for me on this journey to have a willingness to think differently. I just said that one outright. Once I was up and running, I got customizing everything to my liking, and there are a lot of customization options. It's way more flexible than Windows. And by the way, this is a significant item on my list, time shift. 
It's a snapshot backup program specifically for the core operating system. It was installed by default on Linux Mint. If you make a mistake or something stops working, it's practically one click to go back in time to a previous system state. And it takes just your system files back. So it doesn't affect your personal uh, documents or anything. That's still all up to date after rolling back. I've only had to use it once, thankfully, and it was so easy. And now every time I'm like, hmm, this might be the solution to the problem I'm looking at or a worthy upgrade or, or a package I should install or uninstall, but I'm not quite sure. I can just run a time shift backup and it'll be easy as pie to turn back time. Next, it was time to get installing all of my favorite software. And it was very helpful that I am already a big user of heaps of free and open source software, which for the most part, is perfectly happy living on Linux. Seriously, stuff like OpenOffice is just such a good replacement for Microsoft Office. No matter what operating system you use, I think there's so many people out there who should really be freeing as many of their applications as possible. Now, unfortunately, and I anticipated this, a lot of devices and peripherals don't get official Linux drivers. But FOSS saves the day again because an app called Solar can actually manage all my Linux mice and keyboard absolutely perfectly. In fact, it sort of improves on Logitech's Windows software by paring down the nonsense to the, the raw features that I want. And the community creates drivers like this for, for all sorts of hardware. Not all of it though, and we'll come back to that. And beyond just drivers, GitHub is a doorway to an absolute treasure trove of brilliant open source gadgets. It's all very clever and inspiring. I happened to stumble across this new little program that someone has made, which turns off the TV I have connected to my Linux machine uh, when I turn off the machine. Lovely. And once you get comfortable exploring GitHub and a little more familiar with how it works, you can start experimenting with all sorts of wonderful gadgets by all sorts of smart people. And of course you can do this on Windows as well, but uh, even more of GitHub's genius is catered to Linux. And it's not all just command line ciphers, but there's stuff with lovely graphical interfaces as well, like Local Send, which is this really efficient little app that beats out AirDrop and nearby share, and you can install it on any device. I've only just come across it now, but it's not just a Linux thing, but it's everywhere. And you can send files between your devices so easily, it's the best. Um, and then there's Video Mass, which is a, a, a graphical interface for FFmpeg and lets you convert all kinds of files so easily. And then there's Pika Backup, which so much for being on Linux, I feel like I should have to suffer through some very detailed and extravagant backup program that's very complicated and has all these kind of formats. And but Pika Backup is just this beautiful little front end it would look at home on Mac OS, honestly. I say that as a compliment right now, uh, even though I, I generally am not a fan of Mac OS. Now the trickiest stuff that I've had to try and set up on Linux is not the open source stuff. Now, unfortunately, I, I really, really wanted to install DaVinci Resolve, and though it technically works on Linux, it's no easy feat. Did I mention that all of this required a fair bit of time and patience? Well, it did. Anyway, it turns out that to run DaVinci on Linux Mint, I had to turn the file into a deb file, then run that, and then I ran into all these driver issues, and then I tried installing it in a distro box, and that didn't even work. Through all of this, I hit so many roadblocks, and one of the big things that helped me through, ironically, is Gemini and ChatGPT. Yes, the machine learning chatbots of Google and Microsoft are the very things that helped me attempt to leave that world behind. Seriously though, as helpful as Reddit threads and Linux forums and, and Discord servers are, and they are extremely helpful, my constant companion through all this dense troubleshooting were these AI chatbots. And if you can describe things well enough to them, they have a pretty decent knowledge of Linux and they helped me work through all sorts of errors. Now to get DaVinci properly running, I ended up having to install AMD's proprietary graphics drivers. You see Linux Mint by default comes with these open source ones, which are mostly better, but if you're having an issue like I was with a particular application, you kind of have to go with the proprietary stuff. Speaking of, Steam runs so easily on Linux these days, thanks to 
Valve now having a vested interest in the area. Steam Proton can get the vast majority of games running. I jumped into Star Wars The Old Republic, ostensibly a Windows only game. Easy, no problem. And for other non-Linux games and applications, there's Wine and Crossover and Virtual Machines. These days, it's really not that impossible to run software from other operating systems like a champ. I came across some great advice online about this whole process, which is to eventually leave it all alone. Once everything's up and running pretty nicely and you've got your applications and you can do your day-to-day -day stuff, let it rest. You know, resist the temptation to fiddle for a while. Let it settle in. And I think that's good because setting up an operating system can put you in this mindset of tinker with everything, make it perfect. But you ought to snap out of that and not get sucked into that swirling maelstrom of discontent. Just be happy. Tweak it over time. It's fine. I mean, at this point, you've been sitting in front of the computer a lot. I think you've earned a little bit of time away from it all. It's the hardest thing in that moment. I think to just step away, but I think you need it so much. I mean, my back needed it. With all of that, I managed to get Linux Mint running pretty darn well. And a lot of little things are better than Windows, like the way that I can customize things to my liking and make programs run exactly how I want them to. I feel like I'm in control of this in a way that I'm not of Windows. But the big bummer is that I might still have to switch back personally, and it's only because I make videos, which involve all sorts of gear and, and microphones and tools which I plug into the computer, and I need all of their features to work. But so many of these companies, you see, don't have Linux drivers, and the community drivers aren't enough to have full control over these pieces of technology. And it really is a downer, because I feel so close. You know, just about everything works and works so well. Even my favorite video editor, DaVinci, after a complicated setup, runs well. But if I'm going to hit a hurdle every time I need to update the firmware on a microphone or, or be able to connect to a wireless light properly, my computer just won't be doing what I personally need it to do. So that's my journey through Linux so far. And even if I have to pop back to Windows in the end, I'm glad I went on this expedition. I've obviously learned so much and you know, it all just develops one's appreciation for computers and the people who make them. But that'll do it for now. I hope your technology is treating you well. Ciao.